Hello, Adrian. So welcome everyone to our very informal interactive question and answer session talking about the Next Economy MBA. My name is Erin Axelrod, co-teacher of the course and also um, partner, worker owner at Lyft Economy. And Kevin, do you wanna introduce yourself? Absolutely, my name is Kevin Bayouk. I'm also a worker owner at Lyft Economy. I think we have Sean here as well. Sean, you want to say hi and introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Sean Berry, uh, worker owner at Lyft Economy. I live in the Hudson Valley of New York. Glad to be here. Nice to see everybody. Great. So, yeah, I mean, it's a small enough group. There will be people that will join in a few minutes, but it is a small enough group that um, you'd be welcome to, if you want to introduce yourself and how you found out about this webinar and um, where you're calling in from and if you have any questions. Um, that would be great. And um, we, you can also use the chat function for questions. Um, and if anyone has questions that are coming up right off the bat to share, we can address those. Um, I'd like to get this. You can also call me the sponge because I have no questions, but I am definitely excited to uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> just see what's going on here. I am currently in Los Angeles. I go up and down the coast of California a lot, so I could be anywhere at any moment. Watch out. I love mycelium. I'm working on starting a alternative. I'll show you. <clears throat> An alternative styrofoam made from mycelium and cannabis stalks rather than just regular old hemp from Europe. That'd be silly. But in California, we can use uh, just our cannabis waste and grow some shipping containers for wine clubs for California wine is what I'm working on currently. And so many other things, but I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Ardia. Thank you so much for joining. Um, so yeah, we're just going around whoever feels compelled to introduce themselves and where they're calling in from and any questions that are coming up for them around the MBA program. My name's Adrian. Um, I'm here in Berkeley. And I heard about this program because I was taking a permaculture course um, where Kevin, where I met Kevin and Aaron. And so as I looked further into like other things that were going on in that kind of world, this MBA came up. And I've been thinking about um, kind of starting my own business recently. Uh, so I thought this uh, could be helpful. I don't really have any direct questions right now. Just I just kind of read over the website and saw the videos you all have. So I'm just kind of, I want to see like what might be covered and, um, you know, see if it's something I want to move forward with. Great. So definitely hear that uh, we could spend some time covering a little bit the arc of the curriculum, why we created it, um, and how it relates to folks thinking about starting an enterprise. It's a great direction we could go and use this webinar. Before we do that, does anyone have any like burning questions that they want to throw out there that we can capture right off the bat before we go into that? Um, and, and to just say hello and or call, say where you're calling in from. Jump in with that question too. With, um, so I'm Jess. Stafford. We're both based in Atlanta. Um, I do regenerative economy work as it relates to co-creation around like constituent engagement for small towns, primarily in the rural U.S. And just becoming increasingly interested in um, yeah mechanisms, structures, ownership structures, things like that. Um, kind of what is the next step when citizens get excited. Uh, and um, we're both uh, 
obviously let Bradford share about his background here, but we're both interested in this. We're a couple and we've uh, had a lot of these discussions at home and are looking for like a way to explore um, the practical application of regenerative economy uh, together and also looking at a, an agriculture project together. So this seemed like it might be a great container for that. And the question I'd be curious about just is to understand more about your all's journey um, and what like, inspired you to, to start this and kind of what the lineage of it was and you know who are the kind of elders or teachers that inform your work with it. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, uh, I'm Bradford Baker. So I'm actually a business school professor. Um, so I did my PhD in organizational behavior, uh, focusing on behavioral ethics at the University of Maryland and got very lucky on the tenure track job market last year and got a position as an assistant professor at Georgia Tech. Um, so I teach in the Scheller School of Business. Um, and so I'm, one of the things I'm just interested in is potentially <clears throat> being able to bring in more radical um, education models into that environment, um, teaching the MBA students that I work with, um, different ways of thinking and, and seeing and understanding the world. Um, so having more resources to, to have those conversations and to expose the students that I work with around that. And then, like Jess had said, we're looking at potentially starting. I grew up farming uh, in Montana, um, and we're looking at beginning up a, a regenerative agricultural and regenerative economy project in uh, southern Georgia. And so this it looks like a lot of the concepts that are talked about here uh, directly line up to uh, the work that we're hoping to do through through that project. So it's very, very timely. Exciting. Thank you both so much for, and uh, Adrian, for queuing up those questions. So I think that's a great place to dive in. Feel free to use the um, chat function to interact with one another and to ask questions um, and to ask questions of the group too. Certainly one of the ways that we um, facilitate the MBA is to recognize that uh, Kevin, myself, and Sean are by no means the only people with expertise in the room. And so um, that's really the power of the MBA. We currently have 31 people signed up for this next cohort. Um, and we do have folks from different parts of the country, including um, in the, well, actually I can pull up the roster and kind of point out some different geographic regions. Um, and, but maybe what I'll do is, um, Kevin, do you want to start with kind of the arc of, of how we came up with the course? And, um, and then I'll, I'll add and build onto anything that you shared. And we look forward to answering any other questions coming up in the chat. That sounds good, Aaron. Thanks. And I would love to hear more voices uh, also. Um, so maybe as, as we get through stuff, if uh, we can hang uh, and hear from everybody where, where you're at, that'd be fun. Um, how did we come up with the Next Economy MBA? It, it kind of grew out of the work that we've been doing at Lyft Economy. Uh, Sean and I co-founded Lyft Economy uh, nine or so, 10 years ago, or that there-ish about. And we... Most of the practice at Lyft Economy, which has this one of those hairy, audacious missions to transform the nature of our economy to work for the benefit of all life, uh, rather than an economy that tends towards exploitation of people or planet or extraction of resources or extraction from community to an economy that can meet human needs for everybody, um, everybody's needs being met in ways that actually uh, enhance, restore, or regenerate, or benefit the environment while meeting human needs and repairing human relationships as well. And we know that that's a big mission, you know, it's a big vision out there of an economy that works for all life. Um, so we kind of sometimes say it might take 500 years to get there. But we started kind of chipping away at it the best way we knew how, and that was through supporting entrepreneurs, small teams, uh, organizations, that were already starting from a point of a transformative intention. They had a vision to provide goods and services to their community, but they didn't want to do business in the usual way. Um, and Sean and I had a background, the other Lyft partners have, a, have backgrounds both in you know, how to operate within the business as usual kind of economy and the constructs and the norms there, but we also have self-appropriated transformational um, 
uh, experiences ourselves, uh, either through ecosystemic design, permaculture, or other personal growth pathways. And we've married those two together. And so we, Sean and I started by supporting entrepreneurs and teams, um, almost in a coaching capacity or con consulting on particular projects, which brought us into contact with uh, distinct structures. So structures was brought up, uh, whether it's multi-stakeholder cooperatives or uh, benefit corporations owned by a nonprofit or some of the legal structures, but also the operating structures of a diverse array of communitarian horizontal uh, ways of getting things done without defaulting to the norms of hierarchy and exploitation. Uh, and it led us to learn a lot about capital formation and led us to learn um, a kind of develop a pattern language. And over time, we, we were found ourselves having worked with over 100 and now closer to 200 different organizations in this who are starting from a let, let's be transformative space. And uh, over the last few years, we started getting requests from people who were asking, do you have any way to um, share what you're learning from these organizations, maybe in a one-to-many form? Do, are, do, you have, do you teach any classes or are there any workshops and we started experimenting with some one-off uh, kind of webinar formats. Um, so these are people who maybe are just starting an enterprise. Or we had a lot of requests from people who are investors, impact investors, saying, I want to become more literate to actually leverage my resources um, and do investing in a way that is uh, acknowledging that there's this transformative opportunity in the economy. Um, and so we started getting those requests. And so, uh, is it two years ago now? <laughs> two years ago, we, wow, time flies. We launched the first uh, iteration of the Next Economy MBA. And uh, the way we approached that was just to kind of give the contours of what we thought would be uh, a good learning experience based on the, the framework for the training is the pattern language that we've developed for uh, organizations in the economy in the next economy. So the first six sessions of the MBA are kind of like an introduction to uh, shared language uh, of what is the next economy, what's different about it, and a little bit about the problem statement of why is the existing economy um, behaving so badly? Why are there 800 million people today who will be malnourished and hungry? Why is there an environmental crisis that um, truly is an existential crisis with species extinction and climate change. You know, why are those things happening? And how can the economy and the way we provision goods and services for each other, how could that influence or change things? The last, uh, so six sessions, and then there's 12 sessions that follow from that, 10 of which uh, follow what we call, when I say a pattern language, there's a pattern uh, org design that we've seen across all these different kind of next economy organizations. And we basically follow the, that, that structure. We leave a lot, we left a lot of room in that first iteration for uh, kind of a co-creation with the participants to inform what type of both how we explore the material and then kind of uh, adding to what they were most interested in and what they felt would be most valuable. And uh, we continue to do that. So it's a, it's a, it's a real-time iterative where we get feedback after each session, which actually informs the subsequent session. So we do design work. We, we've spaced it out so that we offer a session, we redesign the next session, then we do the next session, we get feedback. Um, but there is, there's starting to now, with, this would be MBA three, this would be a third one, uh, Next Economy MBA. So from, from, we're starting to see, we're starting to feel affirmed that there's some good, solid building blocks, um, but we're still going to keep that iterative pattern. That was a ramble. I'm sorry for the, the long-windedness, but uh, Aaron or Sean, you want to add anything? Sure. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I, I can add a little bit, but, you know, that was pretty, um, you know, comprehensive uh, coverage of, of uh, you know, how, how we got inspired to start. Um, I would just add that uh, one, one of the things that um, we did, Kevin and I had a, a nonprofit that we ran that was connecting other small um, nonprofits and progressive organizations together uh, as a network. 
And from, from that position, we could see across all these organizations that they were having, you know, some similar challenges, right? Uh, and so that was kind of the, the um, uh, you know, inspiration of if we could help these organizations, they're all inspired. They all, they all have an important part of the solution that they're, they're committed to. If we can help them work out the business mechanics so that they can bring that solution to market or, you know, through their, their nonprofit organization, they can create a bigger impact, then that's going to move the whole movement forward. So it's kind of a, you know, we're, we're trying to intervene on a systems level. And, um, and that's very much uh, part of the, the structure of the training, uh, as Kevin's saying, is, um, you know, even ourselves, we're redesigning each session as we go. Um, and what we really want to see and empower you all and just the movement in general is to be really good at problem solving. Um, and be serial problem solvers. That's one thing we see as entrepreneurs is uh, a successful entrepreneur or a company is made up of people who just are really good at solving the next problem and doing it in a uh, prioritized way. So not just any problem, but like the next key uh, strategic thing to solve to, to uh, unlock the growth and development of the company. So that's really what we want to do is, is um, support you all as seeing some of the patterns that we've observed and then really approaching it as a learning journey. We don't know. We've done some things that are helpful, but like, what's going on for you? Let's 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 brainstorm it. Here's a here's a template. Here's a format. Here's a pattern that we've seen. How does it apply to your situation? Um, and like Kevin says, uh, we leave a lot of room for for that being very uh, engaged and iterative. So, for example, on a, a given ninety minute session, we don't have ninety minutes of presentation. We have you know maybe two thirds or so, but then we want to leave that really open and see uh, how engaged the 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 the, the, um, the participants are and where that conversation goes. And so for us, that's a successful session with lots of questions and lots of interest and lots of engagement, rather than we have it all figured out and we're just telling you what the answer is. Um, to model that, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll bring in other voices here in a moment, but um, I just wanted to also call in that um, there's a couple members of our team that aren't on this webinar, but do play a critical teaching role as well. Um, Phoenix Soleil, who is an expert in nonviolent communication, um, mindfulness, anti-oppression, anti-racism work, and um, uh, she was on a meditation retreat in MBA 2 for three months. So we actually recorded sessions with her and had her recorded sessions as a part of the curriculum during that time. But she'll be playing a more involved live role in the MBA 3. So we're really, really honored um, and grateful to have her lens of, because we really do, um, we do see that, you know, like, like Kevin mentioned, the, the malnutrition that is present in the world today, the lack of access to clean water, it's really tied with, um, with uh, racial injustices and economic injustices. Um, and so we, we really are firm believers that deepening our anti-racism lens on the training is just gonna make the network and the movement stronger. Um, for all of us. Um, and what Phoenix says, I'll, I'll just bring in something that she always advises us is when we design for the folks that have been most marginalized from our business as usual systems, we design a better system for all of us. Um, and so that's really a lens that we take, you know, and we, we encourage and support our entrepreneurs um, to take that lens as well. Um, Maybe with that, I'll just open it up and see if any questions are coming up or if anybody wants to pop in and share where they're calling in from that hasn't yet been able to introduce themselves on the call. I don't have a question, then I'll pop in here. Um, Kyle Lawson um, here in San Francisco uh, in the Mission District. And I um, apologize for the background noise because I'm in a shop uh, environment, so it can get kind of loud. Um, I find myself on this call because I met Kevin and Aaron uh, at a, a, a pretty neat event and um, started to look into the website and realized like this is the, it seems like this is the kind of background to business um, not as usual um, that I would like to, to get. I find myself in many different kind of entrepreneurial roles. Um, my background's in human-centered design, um, but I don't really feel like I have a, a language or a toolkit for the business side of things um so even though uh yeah so uh i'm 
I was kind of going through the syllabus and uh, y'all have posted online and checking out the um, uh, videos and some of the other resources and realized like, oh man, I, I don't know how the system works. Uh, and I'd be really intrigued to know, to know more about that. So that's kind of uh, where I'm coming from. Thanks, Kyle. Um, Greener Mind, did you want to? Yeah. Share? Hey, uh, Ben here. Uh, I'm also in the mission in San Francisco. Um, and uh, I think Kyle, I come from the opposite perspective. My background's in economics. And uh, I've spent a lot of my career in startups and community organizations. And uh, I guess my frustration has been that folks still aren't kind of paradigm shifting, like thinking about like Don Milo Meadows and kind of uh, levers of change. I sort of think of kind of going up scale for like a larger kind of higher leverage change. I think that uh, that shifting the paradigm around economics and around equity uh, is really important and especially figuring out how to create jobs in this economy because like I was at a climate job fair a couple weeks ago and there's like 10 employers and like 500 people. <laughs> um, and so it's like, you know, people are sort of really like enslaved to a certain like an oppressive economic system. And so I'm interested in what you guys are doing. Um, Andrew Baskin came and spoke to uh, an environmental science class I took at City College. So that that's one of the ways I've come across you guys. Great. Thank you, Ben. Colleen, yeah. did you want to pop in and share? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Colleen Skemp, and I've actually been working with Lyft um, for about five years through Colab Cooperative, um, which uh, tries to be a, a part of this um, next economy. And so, yeah, uh, that's how I um, came to be here. I'm interested in the possibility for me. I've, I've had, so I've had five years of on the job training in next economy models. Um, and I'm interested in how I can expand on that through some formal training. Great. Well, maybe let's address those questions that are coming up there because those are great questions um, and then we can continue with this iterative answer and respond with more questions um, so and Bradford I just want to say also you had asked uh, well you it wasn't really a question but you had mentioned um, interacting with um, business schools and we do have another uh, person that's registered for this current cohort who's also affiliated with the business school so I think that's a neat tie-in we have had other past uh, participants who've either taken or are took this course before enrolling in a, in a conventional MBA program and so um, and we also had the UC Davis student group um, uh, in sustainable food systems kind of do a, a lens of academic research project on the MBA their most recent cohort um, and so we are we're kind of testing out how to interface with um, academic institutional business uh, curriculum and a lot of kind of business 101 has informed kind of some of the way we design it but then coming back and reiterating it with a lens on you know, environmental, permaculture, regenerative ecosystem approach um, has been how we've created the curriculum. Um, so that's exciting to me, Bradford, just wanted to uh, shine a spotlight on that as, as something that we're, we're actively designing for. So this question that Ben posed, you know, how do we create jobs in the next economy? it actually kind of compels me to share how I got involved in all of this. Um, and I was actually working in a nonprofit for about four years doing lawn to food transformations and installing gray water systems. Um, and so I, I had the kind of on the ground, you know, taste of the possibilities when we align our actions with an economy that really cycles nutrients and provides our needs in more regenerative ways. But I was noticing that the nonprofit was being fueled by um, enterprises, which were you know, donating and sponsoring. And so that's actually what put me on the path of pathfinding towards something like Lyft Economy. Um, and so I did not actually get an MBA, kind of like Colleen mentioned, on the job training was how I got into this work as well. And just um, running a nonprofit and then going immediately into um, working with Lyft Economy. And I think this question around how we grow 
the jobs is really interesting. One of the frameworks that we use in the MBA program is kind of this idea, um, maybe some of you have heard Deborah Fries talk about, um, there's two kind of frames that are happening right now simultaneously, and Kevin's gonna share. Um, there's, as the business as usual economy is growing, um, and you know, for all intents and purposes, it's just endless growth, right? We're, we're seeing, um, we're seeing, we're seeing the impacts of that all around us. One strategy that a lot of companies are taking is actually hospicing out the business as usual economy, Act actively seeking how to effectively kill it, but compassionately and lovingly and nurturingly. Um, and then from the other perspective, there's a whole group of people that are midwifing in a new economy that are not working with existing business as usual systems. They're starting, you know, small bootstrapping organizations. They are, um, you know, creating completely new organizing. Um, Adrian, you mentioned reinventing organizations, right? There's, there's new ways people are reinventing the whole way we organize as um, corporations, as entities fulfilling needed goods and services. And, when we talk about the jobs that currently exist, most of them are still in business as usual because that's where the financial or the monetary, which is the primary means of uh, proxy for uh, tran um, transacting goods and services, has has been caught up for the for the large for the majority, the large part, and so. When I, when I think about jobs, I think, gosh, there's so many jobs in the business as usual economy. And the hospice economy, this business as usual economy, we still, we still see that that is much more visible than the midwife economy. It's more visible and it's more resourced in general in our economy as whole. But what we found is the more we federate, the more we connect to one another, the more we collaborate, and the more we see programs like the MBA, as well as other complementary programs that are really trying to um, use cooperative endeavors to, to knit ourselves more tightly together, the more visible the midwife work becomes and the stronger and the more powerful. Um, so that's kind of a, a bit of an abstract way of talking about how we, the kind of course we need to take to grow more jobs, but I wanted to frame that up first um, and then see if, if, if um, Kevin or Sean want to elaborate on on kind of you know we've seen specific strategies as well in, in terms of how to grow more jobs but that that framing I think has really helped me and a lot of our MBA students kind of think about their role because oftentimes some of us will be doing a portion of our, our day is in hospice work and a portion of our day is in midwife work and we kind of toggle back and forth if, if you know if you know what I mean um, and then some of us are moving how can I move more and more into a midwife type of work and less and less be uh, working in the hospice. But that work of hospice is, is really vital and really critical. And so it's important to see the whole frame. Kevin or Sean, anything to add? Well, sh sure. Um, a, a couple thoughts. Just one is just, you know, is it really jobs that we want to create? Do you really want a job? You mentioned even the current situation is more you know, accurately described as wage slavery. Um, you know, if you don't have a, a, a wage slave, uh, you know, setup, then you might likely, you know, either you're independently wealthy or you might be homeless um, uh, and have, you know, considerable uh, needs unmet. Um, so, you know, if we can design a system that is providing more for people's basic needs, uh, maybe we don't need as many jobs. So that's just a, you know, something to consider. If, if, what are we really designing for? Do we really want to keep people busy 40 hours a week out of the home, away from their families, away from their neighborhoods, you know, uh, in a business setting? Mm, I'm not sure that's working so well. Um, so maybe there's a vision where we're not all, uh, you know, segregated during the day from our nuclear families and working for American or fiat currency uh, to, to you know, pay for basic goods and services. So maybe there's a vision there that we're moving towards, and, and like Aaron's saying, this toggling between hospice and midwife. So uh, maybe there's a part of the hospice curve is creating some, 
next economy is jobs within uh, older organizations, like you see um, corporate social responsibility is a new field, and there's some people that maybe they would really appreciate working in that. Um, and likewise, and on the midwife curve, starting new enterprises and and creating creating your own job or, or getting hired by a, a small or a new organization that's that's working in the next economy. Um, or uh, as some of the, the people on our course, um, our past courses, they've uh, been employed at small companies and because they're small companies, they're able to bring some of the content they learned to work and actually apply those uh, concepts in real time and actually contribute to the growth and development of their own small organization. That's just some of the themes some of the things we've seen um, work. And I apologize, I have to, I have to run off to a, a, a co-op meeting here, but uh, th thanks everybody for your interest and uh, ho hope you can join us. Thank you, Sean. Um, and I just wanna emphasize what Sean shared in terms of um, really strong emphasis on um, uh, no judgment, right? This is not about saying, you know, one strategy is better than the other. One thing we see that's been really powerful for our MBA students is recognizing that when we're, you know, in our corporate social responsibility job, trying our best to pivot a, a you know, entrenched system to a better pathway that's more life affirming, that's more, ner I mean, it can be hard, hard work and it can feel really isolating. So one of the benefits is being able to share with others who are doing similar work, but also complementary work and also creating new systems and then not doing that work of hospice, but doing the midwife work. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to really emphasize that, that it's, you know, it's, it's not about one or the other, it's about us all being connected um, around a shared, shared vision and that it's not, it's a vision, right? It's not gonna happen today, it's, 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 it's in iterative and incremental. Um, yeah, if I, if I could share, Aaron, uh, building off of that last piece, that's uh, one of the reasons why we use these uh, curves or lines or continuum uh, as a framework for this particular aspect of the transition. It's kind of building off Danella Meadows' work that uh, Meg Wheatley and Deborah Fries kind of encapsulated in this um, transitionary systems change framework uh, that hospice and midwifery are not uh, discrete things. There are continuum or gradients. Um, and it's actually becoming comfortable with that and understanding uh, what exists. Uh, sometimes there are people who are doing hospice like less bad efforts like the B Corp movement. There's 2,800 B Corps in the world today. And we would probably describe them mainly as appropriating uh, business as usual structures mostly, not all. Um, but kind of uh, expressing business less bad um, and therefore having a, trans a transitionary but not a transformative effect. If every corporation currently in the world today became a B Corp, I'm afraid we would still have climate change and uh, massive poverty and wealth inequity and many of the uh, we'd be a lot better off. I, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but that's the, the, the transformative of the midwifery work um, is uh, where I think um, I heard the word paradigm, paradigm shifting stuff happens where we begin to explore what's usually uh, marginalized and uh, invisible to kind of culture. And an example of that is like Shauna said, a reframe from jobs to livelihoods. Um, it, we're, we're not necessarily in job creation, but we are about having everybody's needs be met. Uh, but if we start with the idea that I, we don't, what we don't need is jobs so that people can get wages, so that they can explore their personal security strategies like, you know, just paying rent or paying a mortgage and buying health care insurance and uh, saving for retirement. If we change our frame to what we want is livelihoods where everybody's needs are met reliably um, with nobody left out, all of a sudden there's like all these other creative strategies that become possible. And maybe I'll, maybe I'll ask Aaron in a moment to share an example of some of the work we're doing on that, an example of like, what about the personal security strategy of saving for retirement? What does that look like in the next economy? And maybe Aaron could share a little bit about that. But maybe I thought I would share an example to ground this a little bit because frameworks and lines and dotted lines doesn't necessarily help. This is, a, this is an example of a company uh, that uh, at Lyft Economy 
um, when we were looking at net, the, the moving into the next economy, we realized capital formation was a problem. And so we actually piloted a fund called the Force for Good Fund. Uh, the Force for Good uh, Fund is a, is a pilot, um, it's, a provo it's a provocation of, can we have uh, capital that uh, invests in women-owned, person of color-owned, kind of populations that are typically categorically excluded from the capital stack, um, that organizations that are prioritizing impact without compromise, um, but wanting to be a going concern nonetheless. Um, can we make capital early stage, can we make capital available to early stage impact organizations with diverse ownership to model uh, an economy? And so we, we started a fund, which we could talk about a bit if people are curious, but one of the investees in the fund is this uh, um, company, this uh, multi-stakeholder co-op in uh, Colorado called Our Table. And I just wanna tell the story of Our Table for a moment. Um, whereas on the one hand, it's like a farm, you know, on 65 acres using biodynamic practices for uh, mixed organic vegetables and some perennial berries and small animal yields. Um, it's not like other farms. And mainly that's because of the beginning is the structure of it. The structure, um, this looks like an eye chart, but the structure is, it's one of only, I have a list somewhere of about 14 farms in this country that are actually owned by the workers. And if you know anything about farming in this country, you probably know that labor is heavily exploited. Um, and it's, a, it's, a very ch it's challenging economically to be a farmer, um, just to, be a, to have a viable farming operation. So this farm is owned by its workers, but it's not only owned by the workers, it's also partially owned by a network of regional producers in the Willamette Valley area. Um, who provide goods that the farm doesn't grow on its 65 acres. Goods like wheat berries and lentils and um, wine um, uh, and a, a number of other nuts and um, hazelnuts, chestnuts, and so forth. Uh, but it's not only owned by the workers and partially owned by regional producers, it's also owned by a network of consumers people who uh, are you know, CSA subscribers, if you will, for the vegetables and the eggs and some of the yields and the berries coming off of the farm. Uh, but it's also uh, not just uh, multi-stakeholder owned by three different classes of owners. It's also partially micro-vertically integrated. Boy, that's a mouthful. What do I mean by that? Uh, micro vertical integration for a farm, they, they have a small uh, certified kitchen on site to capture any food waste coming off of the farm um, to upcycle it or process it into preserves uh, and to prepared meals to match the consumer norms around convenience. Uh, and they have a small and beautiful boutique little micro marketplace um, on site. Uh, made from natural materials that um, so they can actually sell goods not only from the farm but also from their network of regional producers so that a consumer who lives in this suburb of Portland, um, the suburban area, could come to this micro marketplace and not go to Costco, which is the only other grocer around, not go to um, you know town all the way into the city. Um, they could go to this grocer and find uh, local organic biodynamic produce um, in a marketplace with all the convenience that they would expect from a large grocer. Um, and I, I think it's really interesting because of this structure, the farmers are paid about twice the wage of average, the average farmer in the region, which is significant. Um, and the food, though it's biodynamic and organic, uh, even if it's not certified um, uh, organic, uh, is uh, accessible um, uh, because the prices every year, the owners, the regional producers, the consumers, and the workers get together around a table and they decide how much should the food cost? How much should the workers be paid? Um, it's a collaborative, communitarian discussion and dialogue around fairness and equitability to create a structure that makes healthy, nutritious, nutrient-dense food accessible to those who need it, as well without having to exploit the land or labor.
Um, and, you know, whereas our table is one farm and that doesn't change the food system and doesn't change the economy, I want you just for a moment to imagine in your mind's eye, what if there was a, an our table in every community? What if in this country there were 125,000 our tables? Um, and what would that mean for the food system and for the land and for labor and farming and connection to food? And what would that mean for health and our families and security, regional food security? What would that mean? It would have dramatic implications. Um, so our investment comes along with some services to help blueprint and model this effort. So maybe one of you uh, wants to start an hour table like model. I can give another example, but I, I don't want to be way too long winded. So I'll pause and see if Aaron wants to add anything. No, I think that was great. And it does tie in with Colleen's question, which was, you know, having had five years of on the job training in the next economy models, you know, and how do we take that to the next level? You know, one of the things we notice with our table and so many other is that the, the challenge of sustaining and persisting in an economy where everything is set up to, to, for uh, corporate consolidation and exploitation, like that's what's incentivized pr predominantly in our, the way our economic system operates, is that when you're in a business that's doing cutting edge stuff, it's rare that you actually have the bandwidth and to be able to share that model to help support other inspired founders in other areas to actually borrow and learn from the lessons that you're learning and so that's part of wanting to um, create this mba program is to um, support support those enterprises that are working those stories to be out there in in the popular culture and our in our vernacular about what is working um, and then to help with those patterns and principles and literacy of like why they're working. We call we talk about the price parity paradox, which is this phenomenon that every time we want to do well by people on planet, it ends up that our the price we're bringing the good or service to market is tends to be higher than what is accessible to people. It tends to be a premium priced product. But what Kevin just described this our table is that we can actually care for people and care for planet and have the price be accessible. And those strategies are vertical integration, co cooperation, making your consumers your owners. That's, that's a principle, that's a pattern that we can apply not just to the food system, but to the textile system. We can apply that to the transportation system. We can apply that to the energy system. And each one of you brings your own, um, your own passions, your own skill sets, your own expertise. And so then having shared literacy about the patterns that we each can use in our own sectors can really help us when, when we're trying to actually have language to talk about how these aren't Pollyannish ideas. There are viable pathways to implement them even within the constraints of the current business as usual economy. Um, Colleen, you also ask, um, do we see this balance between hospice to midwifery in the, in the same workplaces transitioning to be part of the next economy? Or are these primarily in different businesses? Um, and I'm, I'm curious, I'm not sure I quite understand the question, but maybe, did you want to put a finer point on that or um uh yeah i i'm i'm wondering if it's a, a form that you're witnessing and talking about in the economy overall and mm -hmm. that certain businesses are provide are are you know operating in the hospice space while others operating in the midwifery space and creating that balance between them or if you're seeing this, and, and, and Kevin spoke to this a little bit, mm -hmm, that he, mm -hmm. that in fact you are seeing it, it seemed like you are seeing it um, in, a, in a single business space, um, a hospice trajectory and midwifery trajectory. It was just a cur curiosity. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, and I think one of the things that, um, that we're refining our understanding as well is that this is, uh, just like any framework, it's it's um it's not a hard and fast rule. Like it's not you know it's there's not um, again the the gradients around you know what someone perceives as a hospice and another person perceives as a midwife. I think there's conversation to be had about that. Um, but I think what it helps me do is recognize that. Um, 
as much as we have a growing and ever expanding database of the solutions that we see are working towards the goal of providing for human needed human goods and services, providing for human settlements in ways that actually regenerate and restore ecosystems and communities. Like that, that bottom line is, is the vision that, that we're holding around the MBA and around the work that we do at Lift Economy. Um, I think what I see so often in the mainstream media and, and popular culture is um, uh, a temptation to look at false solutions that, that aren't looking holistically, right? So, um, and I, I don't want to vilify or pick out one or one or two, because I think many of you on this call may, may know what I'm talking, talking about. It's like maybe the, the fixation around technology will solve our food system. Um, what I think the hospice and midwife framework gives us is that it is complex and the solutions are complex. And so actually having patterns to design in complexity into our institutions and organizations and businesses is really important rather than trying to keep orienting towards kind of oversimplified solutions um, or silver bullet solutions to use a, a relic of business as usual economy. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but it's 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 complex enough that I, I'm not sure that I'm going to have an answer to it. So, um, Kevin, do you want to embellish, or should we go on to this next question, which is the content expectations? Ah, if there's a question about content, I can uh, I can elaborate later on the uh, on the uh, hospice midwifery. free. It's also something we do take a little bit of time up in that one of those first six sessions. Uh, there's some framing around uh, patterns of transformation um, for moving from a an economy that tends towards exploitation and how do we transition to an economy that works for the benefit of all life without compromise. Um, that this framework we found to be helpful. And there's a couple other aspects to it that I could share, but we'll see. Maybe we could start with the content of the training if, 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 um, and then go from there. Yeah, great. So, so there was a, a question about, you know, how do students engage with the program? And, you know, what is the expectation like in terms of your engagement with the materials? Maybe I'll just do a cursory reminder for folks that um, this MBA 3, Previously, we had had it on Tuesday mornings, 10 a.m. to 11.30 Pacific. This time, at MBA 3, we're actually doing it on Wednesdays, um, 10 a.m. to 11.30 Pacific Standard Time. Um, and so that is not every Wednesday, but it's every other Wednesday, so twice a month. That's a 90-minute Zoom call, and um, the uh, the topics are reflected in what Kevin mentioned before in terms of kind of six initial topics oriented around developing deeper literacy around hospice midwife framework and other frameworks to help make sense of what's wrong with the current economy and also what's the vision of where we where we are headed, what could be possible. Um, and then we go into kind of business DNA, you know, kind of design, vision, LLC structuring, um, marketing strategy developing financial projections, um, you know, developing your culture, your team culture, investing in your team culture, HR, recruitment, um, and also that's, that's iterated according to what really people bring and what people are curious about, but we, we hit the major organizational uh, buckets that are important for any organization. Um, and then we kind of are, when we cl close the course, it's about what's next for the next economy. How do we actually um, implement some of these solutions? How do we dive in to create these, um, these communities? So those are the 90 minute sessions. Now on that Friday after, so two days after, that same week that you've had the 90 minute sessions, we have an office hours, which is very similar to this format. It's a one hour format, question and answers. You can submit questions in advance. We have a form that you use, or you can just show up and ask questions um, on the time that, that we are provided. And then throughout the week, you or throughout the entire course, you have access to a comprehensive curriculum that links 
readings, books, podcasts, songs, music related to the different curriculum pieces, art, um, videos, and there's, it's kind of all inclusive. We put a lot of content in that curriculum, but we don't expect you come to every class having read everything. It's, it's, it's opt in. Um, we also have extra fun ass um, assignments. So our homework is called extra fun. And the reason for that is um, we really look at the homework. The homework assignments have been designed to be additive to someone actually engaging with the next economy and running a small business. So there are things like um, de describe your core value proposition or um, describe your client's sales cycle. There are things that we think would be useful for you if you're running a small enterprise, whether it's a nonprofit or a for-profit, but if you're doing something where you're delivering something to the market, these are exercises that are gonna benefit um, your systems, your, your processes. It's gonna um, give you an opportunity to be kind of um, self-analytical about your process and about um, your existing systems and potentially move into integrating some of the principles we go over. Um, and so they, typically don't take a lot of time, um, but they can take as, as long as you want to engage with them. Um, but they're designed from this perspective of, you know, we know that you're busy entrepreneurs out in the world doing incredibly important work. And we recognize that sometimes that entails that 80% of your time is going to be in delivering your good or service to the market. And so that layer of design that you can allocate to reinvestment and, and really deep, deep, thorough planning and design for your business, it's gonna be limited. Um, these exercises and extra fun are meant to um, help you maximize the time that you're spending on the design layer. Um, okay, let's, let me see if there's, Kevin, do you have anything to add or let me check if there's any other um, questions coming up, okay. A question about fundraising coming up. Um, this is something that comes up enough that you know <laughs> there's more available through office hours, and it may even be something where we get that feedback enough that we put two sessions on <laughs> fundraising. One of the reasons why we, um, one of the things we like to say about fundraising and conscientious about um, uh, alleviating. Um, there is a condition where we see a lot of people burning out from bootstrapping way too much. And so we're very conscious of that. But another thing that we like to caution around fundraising is um, to really, really bet all your other options before fundraising, before taking on external capital, before taking on investor equity um, or loans or debt. And, and the reason for that is that we, we've just, we've seen enough stories of people really um, going down the path of uh, taking on debt or, or taking on equity in particular um, and then actually having the mission shift in such substantial ways. So when we talk about fundraising, we really focus on values aligned fundraising, fundraising from the right investor, um, and also what have you done to bolster you, the the good or service, um, the plan for delivering it to the market such that you've tried everything possible um, before going to fundraising. And when you do go to fundraising, you know exactly what it's for and you know exactly the pathway for that money um, to really uh, be able to pay it back. So Kevin, I don't know if you want to add anything to, to what I just shared about that. I thought it was great, yeah. Um, we definitely emphasize alternatives to business as usual norms around accessing capital or resources. Um, though we do have literacy around that as well. So uh, in when um, when somebody says venture private equity is the only venture capital is the is the what I'm looking for, we have a lot of guidance as to what options are available that can uh, retain values alignment um, and even make introductions and so forth. Um, yeah, accessing resources and or fundraising is an important topic and it does come up a lot. I guess to mention on um, We've been pretty delighted in the last in the last two MBAs is that some of the individuals taking the training have special questions uh, that they want to go deeper on. In particular, in this last MBA, MBA two, we started to develop what we call specials, um, which is like there's enough 
people that are interested in a topic to go deeper that we create a separate offering and usually invite in some people from our network um, who are quote unquote experts and or just deeply experienced um, on that topic. Um, fundraising as an example, uh, for the last two MBAs, we've had uh, our colleague uh, Jenny Casson, uh, formerly of Cutting Edge Capital and uh, now Jenny Casson Consulting and uh, providing legal services as Lyft Legal. She um, is an expert in uh, alternative financing strategies and especially securities law. Um, so when you start to experiment on the edges of what's normal around financing, looking at either creative term sheets, creative exits, uh, revenue, royalty on revenue-based models, community investments, um, all sorts of types of uh, retail or unaccredited investing models um, or cooperative structures. Uh, Jenny is uh, one of the world's most, uh, she's an expert at least for um, the statutes that are on the books in, in this country and in many states in this country. Um, so those things that are Im important. Um, yeah, I can, I can, uh, any other questions coming up? Well, we just have five more minutes, so I just want to, um, uh, Colleen did mention, do you explore the other side in terms of business investment practices or obtaining equity in other businesses? Um, and, I mean, we, we definitely do. I mean, one, one thought is that's kind of how we started talking about the, the next egg, which is an initiative that we're partnering with Michael Schumann and um, Janelle Orsi and the Sustainable Economies Law Center on right now, um, which is just recognizing that so much of uh, you know, starting and growing a successful enterprise, there's certainly some of these things um, start coming to mind like, oh, I need a retirement savings account for my employees or, and recognizing, oh shoot, some of those retirement savings account, they might be going to green energy, but maybe far away or maybe it's not even green energy maybe it's a you know a, a coal investment and so we've started to organize um and we have uh, over 150 people that have responded to an initial survey around wanting to move their existing 401k and retirement accounts out of those kind of obscure pools of money that they don't see the impacts and into investments in their local community and we have $29 trillion in the US invested in retirement accounts. So right now, that is most of it, the vast majority is not going into local community businesses, right? It's going into kind of many different uh, Vanguard and mutual funds and much of that are, are big business. And so, but there are strategies that a million people today actually self-direct their retirement accounts and actually use it to um, support businesses right within their community. Um, we just need to get that information out there to more people. We need to reduce the costs so that as an individual, you're not taking on all the costs to move your own money. Um, and that's something that we're working on right now um, with, uh, I'll, I'll put a link in the chat there, but it's to the, the nextdag.org. And we definitely will touch on that in the MBA. And certainly another benefit of our, our MBA um, is that we, we give our MBA students access to a lot of webinars that we do throughout the year on things like commons ownership. So we work with uh, the Agrarian Trust, so recommoning land ownership. Um, things like the next egg, we'd also you know, share access to those webinars. And just like Kevin said, the other special sessions that we do are things that we really want our MBA students to benefit from as well. So, so we'll, we would be sharing things like the next egg opportunities to dig into self-directing self retirement savings. Um, such. Graduates are definitely open to talking to prospective students. Feel free to email me. I'll put my email in the chat there and I can connect you to, um, to other folks, particularly folks that have a similar scenario that you, um, that it might be beneficial to speak with. Um, and uh, Ray has a question here in the chat. Um, how much cl do classes take into consideration immigration status and what will be available or not? For example, loan options that will not be available or limitation of certain structures. 
Um, Kevin, I have some thoughts, but do you sure. want to, yeah. Well, I, I think that's a perfect example of uh, mm -hmm. the type of question that could inform the direction of how we share. Uh, which case studies we share. Um, we have, I, I know for two of the groups that I've worked with through Lyft Economy that have faced similar um, questions um, around, uh, you know, status, um, immigration status uh, with regards to either structuring enterprise or um, even just employment or land access. Um, so those are the scenarios uh, that I have some familiarity with uh, and uh, could reference, you know, as case studies. And, you know, it, those are one of those places and it kind of dovetails with Kali had a question about uh, uh, balance between, uh, you know, the, this compliance strategies and legal HR and accounting or, or more open hearted and trusting on there. There are there are questions of moving into the next economy in some cases do uh, does have us exploring edges edges um, where we um, we become we, we say what is the exposure what are the risks um, of not conforming to the patterns of oppression of the business as usual economy what are the risks of trying out the new communitarian um, structure that's not quote unquote compliant with either uh, as compliant with the, the gray areas, the illegal space, the things where the law is, uh, um, what, what's provocative. So we, we definitely highlight what's provocative. We're not super cavalier and we can definitely share what, uh, we can share the conservative perspective, what, what a lawyer might say, or when we do have lawyers, legal professionals like Jenny, she can represent herself. Um, none of us are, none of the rest of the Lyft team are legal professionals, just full disclosure. Um, so we won't be providing legal advice per se, but Jenny, um, um, and we can, we can represent what we've seen in other cases. Uh, and so we can bring that into the course, but Ray, specifically, it's not like, that's not the kind of thing that's built into the course, um, but it could be um, by, by, by raising the question. Um, and the way it would be brought in from our limited or sometimes extensive experience would be by leveraging case studies or from our lived experience um, of having addressed those types of questions. Um, we're going a little bit over, which is fine by me. I'd you know, love to make sure that you walk away from this webinar with answers to any questions that are coming up. And also I, I did put my email in the chat there. Feel free to email me. Um, or any other questions, especially if you're considering registering and have further questions before making the plunge. Um, and I did just want to also say, you'll see if you go to lifteconomy.com forward slash MBA, um, you'll see that we do have kind of a satisfaction guarantee, if you will, to use kind of conventional language, um, which is that, you know, if at the end of the course, you feel dissatisfied or feel like you did not receive value from the course and you have a conversation with us, um, we are happy to refund the entirety of your um, tuition. Uh, that's, that's our commitment to you to being of service. So um, that is really, you know, our commitment. And, and we can talk about this more in the course, but we also use that type it's a little bit different when we're invoicing with clients but we also use a values-based invoice with clients which means that when we invoice our clients we ask them to review the invoice and make sure that that dollar amount that they're paying to us reflects the value they actually received and so they're then empowered to reduce the invoice down even to zero if they did not receive value from our services um, and we're kind of we, we use that as a strategy to keep us honest to keep us providing outsized value to this movement that we care so deeply and passionately about um, and because we we don't we don't want to perpetuate patterns of exploitation, um, so I wanted to share that as well uh, in case it got lost in the text on, on our on our web page. Um, but yeah, if if any other questions are coming up, happy to answer them. Otherwise, just thank you so much for sharing your time with us today from all the different parts of the world that you joined in. And, um, and, and very grateful to see, uh, to just hear the work that you're already doing out in the world um, and, and consider us allies in your efforts, uh, whether you join the MBA or not, we, we need to grow this, this community and this work.
Um, how do how do we manage our own cash flow with that uh, values based invoicing? Um, oh, live, can, <laughs> live, live, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. I can put in a a, a uh, article that I wrote about barter economy, um, <laughs> and uh, and you know we we do we we live lean and we are also. Um, as a consulting company, we're able to, to be lean in terms of our operating costs as well. Um, we, we work from remote offices. Um, that's another strategy. Um, but yeah, I do. I, I spent a whole year last year bartering for my housing needs and my food needs um, in order to reduce my costs down. Um, and then this other idea with the next day, you know, I have a, a big vision to be able to as we build retirement savings to be able to invest those retirement savings in things like an hour table or a farm that's local to my community so that I can actually be seeing the impact of those savings and how they're making a meaningful difference in terms of job, farming, regenerative agriculture in my local community as well. Thank you all. Um, again, please don't hesitate if any other questions come up. Um, our emails are on our website and also I put mine in the chat. Um, and uh, we will send this recording out as well. Um, and uh, yeah, just thank you for your concern and your consideration um, and for, for doing the, the brave, bold, world-changing work um, out there every day. And I will also send the barter article Cool. I'll do it right now. I'll put it in the chat. So give me one sec to find it. Um. There it is. All right. Cool. Thanks, Al. Thank you. Take good care. Thanks, everyone.